Okay, it's five past. That's not a long break, but it's a break nevertheless. And of course, if you have Bluetooth headphones, you can still be having your cup of coffee in the garden while I start and then you can gradually migrate back to the laptop or whatever. I'm actually hoping you do that. Sitting in the garden having coffee. So <clears throat> let's dive deeper. Let's go into these shared meanings and bring a little bit of, uh, I would like to say heavy theory, but it depends. Maybe this is easy for you. Maybe you're familiar with it. Uh, but at least this is something that really opened at you know the stage I was introduced, really opened my eyes. And then I've been applying this for us facilitators to kind of have a theoretical framework of how to actually create those shared meanings. Here we go. And this is theory and this is the book. And well, there's much more to the theory and it's not like Mr. Wenger actually came up with the theory in itself, but this at least was an eye opening to me and I'm gonna use this to go over all of this with you. So it's Etienne Wenger's book on communities of practice. It's research he made uh, many, many years ago. I think it was an insurance company where you had this like huge open office space and they were the customer service for the insurance company. And I guess, you know, hundred people or something like that. And he was observing as a researcher of how, what kind of processes and how do these people work? And especially how do they negotiate meanings and different situations? And the important stuff that, again, I think, I really like the fact that it sounds obvious when you stop down and think about it. I think that's always the key to a good, <laughs> good research findings or good theory is first of all, he says, we don't make up meanings independent of the world. So let's take, for example, the word value. You know, when somebody tells you that uh, we should do customer value, it doesn't mean like you have never ever heard the concept of customer value. You know, you have something, you take those meanings from the outside world. But however, the second sentence, neither does the world impose meanings to us. It doesn't mean that whatever the, you know, the dictionary says that value is, it doesn't mean that you have to take that. That is what value means for your team, for your organization, and so forth. And what he's saying is that the meaning is located in the process of negotiation, which is a social process we do as human beings. And here's the diagram. So creating meanings, has two parts and I'm gonna go over them. So it's kind of a yin yang diagram of participation. That's what was mentioned in the chat that we need to you know, have people participate in the meaning making, in the negotiation. Listen to people, how, what do you, you know, how do you understand this? What does it mean for you? But also we need to have the reification process, which is that we take those meanings and kind of write them down, literally speaking. But it's not ready. It's a continuous process that he calls the negotiation. So let's let's draw it out in a very ugly PowerPoint diagrams. So let's take that for example. Your job is to figure out what is your new company culture, and you can imagine yourself sitting in a table around a table or a Zoom meeting talking. So what is the new culture for us here at Company X Y Z? And the first thing that Wenger teaches us is that to realize that these things come from somewhere, hmm, just like the temporal onion, that you probably before the meeting had your own ideas what the new culture is for your company. And also that they go from, they will go somewhere, that somebody in the meeting, a person, you know, after the meeting meets another colleague and tells them what the new culture means for the company. And they are not precisely the same. So it's kind of an evolving thing. So to put another PowerPoint, let's say that you know, a couple of weeks ago, the new culture meant this. It was this orange circle. And now today, when we had the workshop, you know, this is what it actually means now. It's still orange. It has round corners, but it's not the same. And then you know, after two weeks, when we put this into the presentation for the whole company, you know, it, it, it looks like that. And then maybe in the beginning of June, when we start the transformation program, the culture, the new culture means this. 
And remember Yari slides back two weeks ago, meaning that what Wenger also underlines is the contextuality in this. So this chart really reminds us that things change, they mutate, that even if we define something, it's not going to be the same because different people are going to interpret the context is going to be different and so forth. Again, my point is here this. This is kind of obvious, isn't it? I don't think anybody here disagrees that when we put a bunch of people together and we try to come up with a shared meaning, it kind of evolves and it changes and it's you know literally not the same every time. But somehow we forget this. Somehow we end up maybe in situations like this. I don't know if you have been in this situation with all due respect to a uh, young gentleman in this picture, but you know, having discussions like this, that what is the new culture for our company? And then people, well, you, what you just wrote down, that's lean startup. Why do you call it our culture? Why do you call it agile? Or somebody says, no, 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 agile isn't this, it's, it's scrum we're talking about. Or then somebody points their finger and goes that, you know, but creating value isn't about this and this and that. So somehow it feels like that we don't, we kind of forget that these things change, that these evolve, that there's not a single answer that you can carve in stone. Or like I put in this thought bubble right there in the middle is that gentleman. To me, it sounds like you're assuming that there is a single clear organization and you're assuming there's a shared definition of value among us in the organization. And obviously we didn't read the Wenger's book. So kind of to wrap up this picture is what Wenger's theory underlines us for in the context of organizational change and change management is to really remind us that things are historical, that we bring the histories, they are dynamic, they change as we negotiate. It's kind of the reason we negotiate because we want them to change as well. They're contextual and in a way they are unique. Something two weeks ago here, now it's here, next week it's there, that these things change. And this brings us that what does this diagram help us in practice? So let's go over those two words, participation and reification. So participation is, is obvious, and I'm sure you are all familiar. This is the part of negotiation where we workshop. <laughs> we have a bunch of people and everybody can give their opinions and we have brainstormings and, and all of that, and just like in this picture. And what Wenger teaches us, at, typically in this process, not just in a workshop, but you know, generally in human life where we negotiate meanings, the participation process brings in how people think. It brings in people's different social roles. It brings that their kind of their membership, togetherness, belonging into different communities, into different groups. Who am I representing? Am I now in this workshop as a customer representative or am I myself or am I now the boss person? Those kind of things are all up there in the air when we are doing participation. Our feelings are important in this. So this is kind of the part where everything is opened up for discussion and we literally facilitate those discussions. So that's participation. Now, what's the other part? Uh, I need a definition first because this word is a little bit more difficult. So here's a definition slide. Reification comes from the Latin word res, which means thing. So literally, it means making something into a concrete thing. So vocabulary.com gives you this lovely definition that reification is a complex idea for when you treat something immaterial as a material thing. And their example is a wedding ring. So a wedding ring, <clears throat> it's concrete, it's definitely material, but it's actually about something very abstract and intangible. So it's making something abstract and intangible into a concrete object. That's the process. And when I put it like this, I hope it becomes obvious. 
So reification, what we do in our jobs is that when we write down documents, when we start drawing maps, uh, customer journey maps, or you know, whatever, when we do a video, hey, let's do a 10 minute video to show what this is all about. Uh, when we create tools or when we have a tool, the tool reifies something, instruments, the actual rules. Let's say that let's make a war room. Let's have our own project room. That's a reification of what do we mean by all of these things. Posters, you know, titles in our business cards, they're reifications of what do we mean about things. And, so, and the point from the theory is that these two things come as a pair. Now, if we need to facilitate shared meanings, if we need to facilitate what is value for us, or what is our new company culture, or who are our customers? That's a good question. We need to be conscious that it's a two part process. There's the participation part, but there's also the reification part. And the reification is important because it makes up for the limitations of the participation. So if we only have workshops, if we only discuss endlessly with people, you know, nobody remembers anything in the long run. Nobody's taking notes. You know, how do we clarify what we actually talk? So the reification is critical. But so is the participation part, of course. It makes up all the limitations of the other side. Participation is where we listen to other people, where we have different interpretations, where the diversity comes in, where we have people committing, we have ownership, something we talked about earlier in the chat comments. This is the part where we get the different ideas. There's when we, when we can try different lenses on things, we can have different perspectives. Everything's open, everything's under discussion. And you can't get that if you just have reifications. But you also be very uh, conscious that let's say that if participation dominates, that we just have too much of discussions and very little reification. The problem in a larger context for us as a company or a community is that we don't have enough stuff to anchor the meanings. You know, Maybe you have been in situations like, wow, I think this is the third workshop that we're discussing what is customer value. Didn't anybody write down these things? So that's a fancy way of saying that is nobody anchored down the meanings. So the negotiation doesn't go anywhere. But of course, if you have too much rate against if you don't have those discussions, then the problem is again something you're familiar with. There's no dialogue to create those shared meanings. People don't have commitment and ownership. This is the comment that we had earlier in the chat. So for example, the obvious that you just get top-down orders or you get guidelines, but you know, the big boss order told us to do this. It told us to create value, eliminate waste, create value. Okay. What, does, what do they mean by value? What do they mean by waste? Where's the participation part that I can bring my views and my questions and so forth? So going back to the very point I'm picking from Wenger's book, that we take these principles like agile, lead, design thinking, lean startup, and the tools and the ideas from the world, but they cannot be our meanings as such. We cannot take them like a, you know, like a bottle of or a carton of milk from the grocery store drink. We know, no, we need to start negotiating what do they mean for us. And that also means that we need people who do the reification work and we need people who do the participation work. It doesn't happen automatically. And what I'm calling this work is curation for the reification. So just like you, you know, in a museum, there's the collection of, of photographs in a photography museum. It's the curator who takes care of the collection. And of course, facilitation is something we're all familiar with, that you're facilitating the participation. To put it into images, what I'm looking is, what I'm saying is something like this. 
as a good change agent, the person trying to make the change happen, we need to balance these two. We need to have both. We need to have the librarian, but we need also the workshop facilitator. And this is, if you have a designer background, for example, service design, this is kind of like, yeah, I've noticed, I need to do both. It's not enough for me to empower people and facilitate workshops. I need to keep kind of track of the library, the meanings and everything that happens. I'm just saying that we need someone, somebody has to do this because otherwise, just like the Wenger book says, we get these kind of blind spots and things don't go forward. The change, the facilitation doesn't go forward. And then of course, typically we only talk about facilitation, we talk about the right hand side, but how often we actually think that facilitation is all about the curation, the reification as well. And you can add the word leader here, of course. Because what I'm saying, and I'm sure that Yari would agree, at least to a certain degree with me, that this is pretty much what modern, you know, nowadays leadership is about. It's balancing between participation, because in the companies and organizations that all of us work for are full of experts, knowledgeable people who understand things much better and typically the leader. So the leader needs to have the participation, the information, the commitment, the ownership. That's kind of what we had in the new culture. But the leader is also the person who has the capabilities and the possibilities to be the curator. The leader has the opportunity to talk with team A, team B, team C, and curate those answers and kind of work between those teams and kind of have the participation being much bigger than a single workshop or much bigger than a single team. Let's see the chat and let you digest that a little bit. What would you say is the best translation for reification in Finnish? Hey, okay, that's a great, I thought about that. Uh, I don't have an answer. If you go to the social sciences where this comes from, I have a feeling that in Finnish they say reificatio. Sentinet creating. There's a Arto puts a video from Tieto. We need to look that. That's we need to check that out as homework. Richard, ha, Richard. No, it's not Richard. It's Richard's Android phone saying that concrete disorder might be the Finnish. One. I wonder how many leaders think of themselves as facilitators or curators. I don't know. And again, remember, leader. I think all of us agree. Leader doesn't mean that you are in a formal leadership position. You could be a leader just by people following your example, that people think that, hey, that's a smart person. And there's a leadership in that as well. Yeah, that's reification in Finnish, I guess. It has a little bit of a different connotation in the Finnish language, a negative one. Yeah. What if the change leader has a clear vision of where to go, how to include people's opinions into that? Vera. Excellent question. If you know what everybody should be doing and where you're going, how do you balance between you having a vision and the responsibility, but then also having people commit into that and having ownership with it? I guess you need a little bit of participation and verification. But here's the thing. If you look at the picture I have here, these two pictures, and imagine yourself there, do, you know, being on top of pro both processes, that's, of course, a huge position to shape things. And if you are the leader, if you are the CEO, if you are the business owner, then that's what you should do. That's you, as, a, as a curator, as a facilitator, it doesn't mean that you, you don't have ownership yourself or responsibility. No, it doesn't. But part of the responsibilities you have are the reification of the participation. I have an example here. <clears throat> so this is Halton. I don't think there's anybody from Halton now in the audience. If you are, then, then wave your hand or that. Halton is a Finnish relatively big company doing air conditioning technology for special uh, circumstances, such as uh, large kitchens and, 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 and what else. Nevertheless, uh, this is a story from their corporate CEO. And, and I think this is a brilliant example. 
So the story goes that they actually started working a lot of participation and reification of coming up with a company mission, the mission for the company. And they came up with this, uh, the one that says on the top, it's in Finnish, but that's my translation underneath it. We enable people's well-being in demanding indoor environments. But the thing that when he told me about the story was that it's not like that sentence in itself is any magical. You know, it's it's kind of for us not working at Halton or not Halton's customers. We're like, oh, okay, whatever. But the whole process, they had the whole company, everybody in the company involved with it. They had the middle managers and the leadership commit into the participation, into listening to people, getting their input, understanding what they think is meaningful, what do they think is important. They had their customers in the process. And after this process, the tip of the iceberg is that one sentence. But you know, underneath, the tip of the iceberg. What they realized that once they had done this was that this became a framework for decision making. It, a lot of commitment from their stakeholders. It was a starting point for their growth strategy and so forth and so forth. And importantly, it got a lot of commitment and meaningfulness from the employees themselves. So, of course, the thing is that it's, all of this didn't happen because, like I said, because the, the sentence was somehow magical. That's like, wow, what an amazing sentence. I shall now go and work for Halton. No, of course, that's not the thing. Because they did a lot of work from top down, starting from the leadership. And I bet it took a lot of time. It took a lot of effort and hell of a lot of discussions. But at least according to the CEO, Kai Kononen, it was definitely worth it. That was money and time and resources well spent because they had a shared meaning of what's the mission for the whole corporation. Lovely story, isn't it? Uh, like super lovely because it's true. Ready for the breakout rooms. Uh, yeah, a lot of discussion about uh, share, finding a shared meaning for the Finnish version for reification. How to help people not to feel frustrated about constant meaning making? Oh, well, that's 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 a great great comment. You know, endless workshop discussions and meaning making. When do we get to do the work? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good balancing act. I guess it also needs to that, that especially the Halton case. I remember that of course it needed convincing people that this is time well spent. And then people need to understand what's our objective. Why are we doing this? What are our goals? Maybe they had dumb goals. Even. Hmm. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to ask you to go to the breakout rooms. But before we go there, uh, a very small change for your own benefit. So before, uh, I'm going to soon give you the exercise uh, for the breakout room. But let's do it so that for one or two minutes, think, think alone in, in peace and quiet. Uh, so that you know, you don't have to have an answer ready immediately, but you know, think a little bit alone. And while you do that, we're going to balance the rooms because last week we had some rooms have two people and some people had six people. So we're going to throw you into rooms and then we're going to individually you drag and drop between the rooms. So don't worry, after about a minute or two, you will be in your room. And while we do that, think about alone in silence. And once we're done, then roughly 10 minutes, uh, let's put uh, Lee and Kiara, let's put something like 12, 13 minutes there. And then a little bit of a house rules, just to remember uh, one talking point at a time. Don't go and list all the five things you want to say just once and then give other people an opportunity to talk as well. Make sure that everybody gets an opportunity there. But of course, don't, you don't have to talk. If you just want to listen and think about it, that's perfectly fine. Uh, don't, don't take any stress. And appreciate that there's quite nice, heterogeneous, diverse group of people here. So appreciate all of that in there. Ready to go. Uh, yeah, I haven't given you the question. Here is the question. 
think of a familiar context for you, depending on your different backgrounds. Are you wondering how to make your team work? Or are you thinking about how to create a successful workshop? Are you responsible for managing a business? Here's the question. What meanings you probably have to curate? What are the terms, words, concepts that you probably have to curate and participate? What you actually say to go share over there. So what are the terms and concepts that you think everyone should understand the same way? What meanings you probably have to negotiate? And write in the chat once you get out of the room. Ready to go? Take a picture of that. Change the word curate into negotiate. Uh, but I'm sure at this stage you pretty much know what to do. A couple of minutes in silence and then go. Lee, Kiara. Be me up, Scotty. Welcome back, welcome back from that transportation. Please do again, put the, in the, into the chat a couple of bullet points you found out. Yeah, there we go. Work times, shared work strengths, shared responsibilities, definitely not done, what is good enough, meanings in a new job. How can you have shared values when you have your own? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, organizational values lead, agile values, customer values, yeah. Listening, involvement, engaging all participants. Listening twice because it's important. Better UX. Room 54 says, what does soon mean? Yeah. Couple of good. Intranet. That was a good one. Yeah. These are great. I hope you had a good time as well. Uh, here's actually something I did with a group of people almost two years ago, I think two years ago precisely. So we had a, with Alto Executive Education, we brought together altogether 30 people, Finnish corporate leaders and uh, experts on work life and change, uh, the changes in the work life. <clears throat> and we had workshops, three workshops with them. And all of that is actually documented, unfortunately only in Finnish, but those of you who can read Finnish, uh, this book is, downloadable for free over there, which is the end result of those workshops. And one of the things in those workshops, we talked about what are the meanings people have to curate, uh, the leaders in the organization. So this is what corporate leaders and experts thought. Uh, so here's kind of a quick list of this is most probably as a change leader, you need to start negotiating some really big words or terms. What is change? For example, what is considered work? Now that's a big one. I think that kind of came up also in the chats as, as I glanced. Who's responsible for lifelong learning? So our constant learning as individuals or as a learning organization or as a society, who's responsible for keeping us up to date? What is value we talked about? Meta skills required. That's something we're gonna come back in this course later on. And these are kind of like the facilitation skills, but all of these skills that I guess you have recognized that you need, but are not like technical, classical skills that are taught in university or school. And last one is my favorite. What are the desired silos and borders? We so often think that, you know, let's break the silos and let's blend the borders. But actually you need some silos and borders. Otherwise it's called chaos. So that's in the book. That's what the big, big bosses and leaders and experts thought that these are typically the things that you need to start discussing on a large organizational level. Uh, doing these slides, I actually noticed I started with this question, uh, kind of you thinking which method you should choose. 
But at this stage, I spent a lot of time, but I never actually answered the question. So which one to choose, design, agile, lean, or lean startup? And I guess you already know that the answer is uh, a professor's famous answer, it depends. But I hope I have given you some tools to figure out which one to choose and, and you understand the context and everything. So kind of understanding that, you know, start with some, you know, to be very concrete, start with a canvas. Maybe it's the business model canvas, lean canvas. You probably have an idea. I'm going to get back to this of where you should start. But of course, you should start the process of negotiation. So in a way, I'm saying that it really doesn't matter that much which one you choose. Because what you should start immediately is the negotiation process, which is, of course, adapting it into the, your organization. So whatever you charge, you know, Whatever you start with, there's going to be participation, and then it goes to be reification, and then you get your version, your company's version, your organization's, then more participation, more reification, more participation, more reification. So you should start the process of adapting it, of tailoring it, whatever you call it. And that's what it starts looking at. That's, that's what it looks like. Which one you should start? Should you take a lean startups framework, for example? Yes, yeah, start with that and start building. What are the tools? What are the objects? What's the organization? And at the same time, you know, the participation part. How are people thinking about it? How are they behaving? What are they actually doing? Are they understanding this? And then updating the concrete parts and the people, concrete people, and so forth and so forth. So maybe let's take the temporal onion, the tool of the last week, not the tool of the week, the tool of the last week. So if here's your change project, your change program. So how to choose which approach? Now, here's my two cents. Again, let's start with the future. So what's actually, imagine yourself, you have been given the task to design a change program for your organization. What's the desired change in the long term? What has happened one year after the change project or program? And six months, and one month. And what needs to be, what needs to have happened to reach the impact after one month? And what's the history? Where do you come from? What's your domain? Are you in the grocery stores business? Are you an insurance company? Are you building? A you know, machines or are you a digital service company? Where do you come from? What are your people's skills? How do they think? Who needs to be involved? And maybe all this is the first point of thinking of how, which school of thought should you start with? Helping you, just as simple again, facilitating you to make an educated decision where to start. I'm going to give you an example from my personal history. Um, so being in, in a similar situation like this. So literally, as a previously being a consultant in charge of, of designing a change program uh, for a large company. So I'll give you an example of how those went and, and what, what do I mean by all of this. So I was involved uh, sometimes being kind of the principal person, but sometimes being just a consultant or just being a teacher in change programs in these companies, for example. And typically if I put them together, so what was the setup? So the thing that all of these companies wanted some kind of an internal accelerator program, more or less. The change that all of these wanted was to build a responsive innovation culture and change the way of working for these companies. What was their goal? to create their own capabilities so that they don't have to buy it from outsiders and consultants, but have their own capabilities develop somewhere in the lean, agile, agile startup way of working. Not that clear of what, what you know, fits them. They wanted something that fits their company. How? Now, this is kind of the way that, that I'm familiar with. Let's start an accelerator program, which means that they would have real projects and they're being accelerated by you know, coaches and teachers and a specific program of creating a new business in a different way. 
And of course, the goal was that after the accelerator program, there would be the next step. And typically that was having the people in the program become kind of ambassadors of the new way of thinking and doing, but also demonstrating inside the company that our company can do things differently. We can be very design centric. We can be very agile. We can be very lean and so forth. Good. So typically uh, the accelerator programs and I would generalize this <laughs> to many companies, is that if we draw the onion that here's the individual person and they have a project, and typically the project is part of some business area of that corporation. So the accelerator program is something that is put there in the middle, that you take the projects and those projects are accelerated. So they get results faster or in a new way. Typically faster is a simple value in this. So how to design this? So a two to three month accelerator program. So how I did it with my colleagues. So first of all, typically the discussion was that what's the actual impact in the long run? What are you aiming at? If you're investing this much money into a program, what do you want? Uh, well, typically they wanted that they wanted to find their own way of working. That and maybe two of the three projects in the program would be already real products after a year. But they also wanted that this would be the beginning of starting maybe an internal laboratory, like an innovation organization, and then have a C-level person responsible for the new ways of working. So this would be an important step for the big change. That was the long term. And before that, maybe they uh, typically they wanted to establish some kind of an innovation lab where, you know, it wouldn't be a project, but a continuous lab of doing new business innovation and all that. Uh, and then maybe after one month, the projects in the accelerator would receive funding to go further. They would start training of their own coaches and getting rid of external coaches and maybe starting a second accelerator program. So what that meant for us in the program was that after the program, each project was at least on the conceptual level and had a plans for funding so that they could apply for the funding and so forth. And so, so questions in the beginning, how are we driving change at the moment? What has been done inside the company? What tools and processes people are familiar with? And then kind of practical stuff, but they're in the red, making the decision. So which kind of tool set, methodology, school of thought we should take. And then as a side note, what we actually did was then we started the lead service creation tool set was designed especially for this purpose for companies to have a methodology and tool set open source that is really tailor made for starting new ways of working in a large company. So that was the example. Uh, I have a little bit more about it, but I'm now going to jump to the final slides. So you can check out from the slides, a couple of typical organizational issues that came up after starting these accelerator programs. But let's now move on to the end of the lecture. Here's your homework, which we already talked in the beginning. So it is doing the dumb, asking dumb questions from your pair. And yes, sorry, last time I had a mistake here. Submit through the submission form, not email before Wednesday or on Wednesday uh, next week. So that's the exercise. We're gonna put this separately now into the medium and getting close to six o'clock. So that's it. That's half of the lectures done, time flies. Remember it's Wednesday next week, Wednesday, not a Thursday. But don't leave yet. Here again, a couple of articles to read. Uh, studies and Wenger's book as well. But I pinpoint that uh, talk by Je Jeff Gotthelf from Ule Arena. Uh, should be visible, I think. I'm not sure if that's visible outside Finland because it's uh, Ule's Arena, but let's hope it is. That's a good talk of how he put all of these different methodologies together. And he's kind of a American guru on these topics. So that's always nice to hear. I still two minutes to go, but here's your checklist. Attendance, uh, 
that's Valerie Lee put it over there. It's in the chat, the link to the attendance form. And the little feedback you write, that's super important. Uh, we read that. So uh, as you probably noticed, the little changes and tweaks we made for this lecture are based on the feedback we're getting from you. And it's also super important for us to have some kind of a pulse of, of how you are doing, how you are learning, what is working. So super thanks for writing those uh, even small sentences into the attendance form. Slides and everything will be on Medium, exercise pairs uh, coming through email, and uh, any questions, those are the channels. Can I please show the exercise once more? Absolutely. Here's the exercise. We're gonna get a pair, and you are gonna be asking, facilitating your pair's project. And you're gonna be asking for them to make the dumb goals and then you switch. So you also need to have a project ready, can be the same as previous weeks, can be a new one, but have a project ready and then the other person starts asking you dumb questions, but kind of together set the dumb goals for your project. But remember the other person is the facilitator, you're the one responsible. And again, reflect on all that. I'm done. I had a few slides, but we'll be, we'll we'll manage without them. Yari, yes, say something. Ah, it was interesting stuff, and then we will con continue next week on Wednesday. So remember, it's not in Helatorsta, but in on Wednesday, same time, same channel, and uh, we will go then take a deeper dive to to facilitation and more this participation part but also this reification is important, but, but we'll see you in next, next Wednesday and hopefully you all, all come and join us. And you notice, notice there's, there's Pia and Christina asking you that, yes, there's a lecture next week. Yes, 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 there's a lecture, but it's on Wednesday. That's what we're trying to say. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to be hanging around if you have any questions or comments, but otherwise, have a great Thursday yeah. evening. And have a nice Mother's Day as well. Remember yeah, mother. remember mothers. That's a good point.